Well, good morning. Good morning. Today we continue in our series on AHA, it's part five, and uh, as we've gone along in the series, we've seen that the AHA is an acronym, A-H-A, and where the first A stands for awakening, the H stands for honesty, and today we're going to continue by looking at the last A, which stands for action. And uh, to that end, I wanted to share with you a story about a woman by the name of Norma McCorvey. Now, you might not be familiar with that name, but I guarantee you know who she is. Norma McCorvey was known as, or was called, Jane Roe in the landmark court case Roe v. Wade that legalized abortion in the United States. Back in 1969, when Norma was 21 years old, she began her case to legalize abortion. But by that time, she had actually gotten quite a list of accomplishments in her life. Uh, growing up, she was involved in robbery, drug dealing, she was a heavy drinker. She had sexual affairs with both men and women. She had been married when she was 16. She then immediately got pregnant, but was divorced before the child was born. She had a second child out of wedlock a year later. And then by the time she was 21, she got, she got pregnant for the third time. So this time she decided she wanted an abortion. Well, she went to go get one and found out that it was illegal. So she then lied about having been raped in order to try and help her cause so that perhaps she could get the abortion. Well, some attorneys found out about her case and decided to take it on, and of course, you know the story, it went all the way to the Supreme Court where she was ultimately victorious and uh, abortion became legal. Well, after she had won her case, she went to work at an abortion clinic. She was a very strong supporter of abortion rights. Well, it just so happens that at the clinic she was working at, the pro-life group Operation Rescue opened up an office right next to to that clinic. And uh, Norma McCorvey would go out, she was a smoker, and she would go out uh, outside the building and on uh, cigarette breaks uh, every day. And there was a pastor who worked at the Operation Rescue uh, office, and he went out and kind of um, struck up conversation with Norma, kind of uh, developed a, a friendship with her. And over time, he began to share his faith with her during those, during those breaks. Well, uh, it turns out there was a little uh, seven-year-old daughter of another person who worked at Operation Rescue, and this little seven-year-old girl also got to know Norma uh, over time. And one day, the little seven-year-old invited Norma to church. Well, Norma had been thinking pretty deeply about what the, the things the pastor had been uh, telling her, and so she decided to accept the invitation. Well, during that church service, Norma experienced uh, what you might call an aha moment. She awakened to the fact that she had actually been wrong about abortion, and she was honest about having done what was wrong in God's eyes, and so she decided to act. She decided to do something. And so during that church service, she accepted Jesus into her heart as her personal Lord and Savior. An amazing turnaround, to say the least. Uh, a few weeks later, ABC News actually televised her baptism on, on the TV. You might say that Norma McCorvey was lost, but now was found. Like Norma McCorvey, we need to act once we have awakened to our sin and been brutally honest about it. And we've seen these aha principles as uh, they're reflected in the parable that Jesus told of the prodigal son in Luke 15. Today, uh, I want to pick up that. I was going to start at 17, but it's better if we start at 16, just for context uh, sake, uh, where we read this. Uh, and, and look, by the way, for those of you who might not have been here, let me just remind you in this parable, the, uh, the son goes to his father and says, please give me my inheritance right now. I want, want it right now. And so the father gives him his share of the inheritance, and the boy takes off, I don't know if he's a boy, young man, takes off to what the Bible calls a distant country. <laughs> obviously, a Gentile country. And there he blows through his money, blows through his inheritance with sinful, wasteful living, wild living, and uh, then winds up with nothing. And so he literally uh, is forced to take the only job he can find, which is working with pigs in a pigsty, and he's so hungry, he's contemplating eating the pig food, so he's literally in a, in a really bad shape. And that's where this parable picks up in verse 16. It says, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. So this foolish young man had sunk about as low as a man could sink in that Jewish culture. 
He was living among Gentiles, and the Gentiles were unclean to the Jew. You wouldn't associate, you wouldn't go near Gentiles, but here he is living with them, even working for one. And then he's working in the filthy mess of a pig pen. And again, pigs were unclean for the Jews. Jews wouldn't not only eat pigs, but they didn't want to go near pigs or have anything to do with them. They were unclean. We stay away from those. And so here this guy, he's with Gentiles, he's working in the pig pen, and he has nothing to eat. And so he's contemplating, boy, that pig food sure looks good at this point. Well, he finally comes to his senses. And he realizes that the, uh, clearly he has chosen the wrong path in life, and now he is suffering the bitter consequences for it. Even the hired help back at his father's house is better off than he is. So he makes the most important decision of his life. In 18 and 19 we read, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So this prodigal son awakens to his situation and he's honest with himself about his sin. You can almost hear the sadness and remorse in his voice. He wants to change. He's learned the hard way that enjoyment of sin is always short-lived, but remorse for it is long-term. So he decides to go and confess his sins to his father. You notice the order of um, those he has sinned against. He says, I've sinned against heaven and against you. First he says he sinned against heaven. The ancient Jews often substituted the word heaven for the word God. And the reason for that is that they, they held God's personal name to be so holy, to be so beautiful and so pure, that it would be blasphemy if you mispronounced it. And so Jews typically did not try to pronounce God's name. They would substitute heaven or the word Lord, but they would not use God's personal name. I find that quite amazing when you contrast how God's name is used today in our culture. How often is God's name used as a, a common curse word? The holy, righteous name of God is blasphemed on a daily basis in this country. Uh, it is shocking, really, how things have changed so much. But this young man realizes that he sinned against God. That's his biggest sin. But he also knows he sinned against his own father by dishonoring him. By failing to honor his father, this son broke the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. So at the same time, he's broken God's commandment, and he's also sinned against his father. As a result, he hopes to maybe, maybe, be accepted back at his father's house as one of the workers. Maybe he could at least have that much. It'd be better than what he's got now. And so he heads towards home. In verse 20, so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. I'm sure on that long way home, that prodigal son must have been agonizing about how his father was going to react to him. Would there be anger, resentment, out and out rejection? All of those things he knew he rightly deserved. But instead, his father had compassion on him. His father's heart went out to him. Can you imagine what he must have been thinking as his father has this kind of reaction to seeing him, embracing him, kissing him? You know, I'm sure this young man was confused and then uh, followed by incredible feelings of relief, and then probably complete joy. Wow. Well, so he begins to make his confession as he had rehearsed to his father in verse 21. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Well, the son begins, just as he had rehearsed, to confess to his father what he had done. But before the son can even finish his confession, the father interrupts him. And the father says, go get the best robe. Get, you know, bring these gifts as a sign of my love. And the gifts are extravagant. These are not just token gifts. The best robe, in that day, it was typical for um, families to reserve a very expensive and a very beautiful robe for special guests of honor who would come and visit them. And this is the robe that the father calls to be put on the son. 
And in that, and the ring, he says, well, put a ring on his finger. A ring was uh, very uh, important because it was carrying the, assign, the, the um, authority of the person who owned it. If you had the person's ring, you sort of carry that authority. We see this in the Bible sometimes when a king gives his ring to one of his advisors. And then the, that advisor can, with the authority of the king, use it to seal letters, uh, the wax seal that was on letters. And so um, that ring was carrying the authority of the king. And now the son is given the father's ring, carrying the authority of the father in that, in that household. And the sandals, put sandals on his feet. The sandals in that day were something that separated a slave or a servant from someone who was free. Servants went barefoot, but those who were free wore sandals. And then the father calls for the calf to be killed and eaten. In those days, it was very rare for a family to eat meat during a meal because meat was extremely expensive. And so if you, had, if you were wealthy enough to have a, a calf like this, it would be saved for a very special occasion, like a wedding, something that would be a, a, a huge celebration. And so the father calls for that special calf to be killed and to have that kind of celebration. So we can see that the very best in the father's house is lavished upon this repentant son. It's clear from the father's reaction to seeing his son that there was total forgiveness. And I think this story illustrates the biblical truth that there's only one sure way to be forgiven of your sin, and that's by confessing it to God. Any sin, no matter how, how severe, and this son's sins were severe, will be forgiven if we simply repent of it and turn back to God. And his forgiveness is complete. He doesn't hold it over you. He's not going to bring it up again. It's completely gone. It's kind of like Abraham Lincoln once said uh, towards the end of the Civil War, Someone asked President Lincoln, what do you intend to do to these rebellious Southerners once they're completely defeated? And of course, the questioner was expecting Lincoln to exact vengeance and punishment on the Southern states. But Lincoln simply answered this. He said, I will treat them as if they had never been away. Reflecting a, a, a real forgiving heart. But notice in this parable that there's much more than forgiveness going on. The father has not only forgiven his son, but he's restored him. The son is given a place of honor and authority in that house, all that he had before he left. The father holds nothing against his son, but has poured out abundant grace on him. And I think Jesus is showing us how God deals with a repentant sinner. God forgives us and then restores us to the same relationship we had with him before we sinned, before we left. I want you to look back for a moment at verse 16. Back when the prodigal son was in the pigsty, living in the results of his sin, and it says that no one gave him anything. Contrast that with what his father did. Gave him everything when he came back. Everything the younger son hoped to find in that distant country, he received when he got back home. Clothes, jewelry, uh, respect, a joyful celebration, love, security. In the distant country, he found abundant mercy. Excuse me, he found abundant misery. But back home, he found abundant mercy. You know, we usually associate the word prodigal with waywardness or sin. Do you know what that word prodigal actually means? Yeah, it means, well, it, it means lavish or extravagant. That's, that's actually, most people don't realize that. And the reason this parable is called the prodigal son is because the son's... Um, Sin was that he was so lavish and extravagant in his wasteful spending, in his wastefulness. Some have suggested that this parable should be renamed the prodigal father because of his extravagance in his mercy and in his compassion and forgiveness. The father was so ext extravagant in his compassion. When we sin, even in the biggest ways, if we repent and turn back to God, he is extravagant in his mercy and his forgiveness with us. I want to share just a couple of scriptures that teach us something of the nature of God's forgiveness and restoration after we sin. In Psalm 103, verse 10, we read this, talking about how God's forgiveness. It says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And then in words highly reminiscent of this parable, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. 
And then we read something in Deuteronomy 30. Mo Moses writes to his people, and so many of the words that Moses uses are just parallel so closely what we see Jesus using in the prodigal son, and I've highlighted those for you. Look at how similar Moses writes to the uh, Israelites. And when you and your children return to the Lord, your God, and obey him with all your heart, with all your soul, um, and with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I've commanded you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you, even if you've been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, where from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. I think it's just amazing how the language in the Old Testament is so similar to what Jesus himself is using, uh, just showing us that God's truths are truly eternal and woven throughout uh, the text of our Bible. And then finally in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just like the prodigal son's father gave him gifts when he repented, our Heavenly Father gives us the gift of eternal life when we repent. It is the ultimate gift. Nothing is more beautiful than knowing that there is hope and forgiveness and restoration when we come back to our loving Lord. Well, then in verse 24, the Father says, For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and so they began to celebrate. Here the boy's father says that while he was away living in sin, the son was, was lost and, and dead to him. He was dead, but what? But now he's alive. He's alive again. What, is it, what do you call it when you go from death to life? It's resurrection. Okay? The conversion of a sinner is like a resurrection from the dead, being made spiritually alive again. And do you know that that's really the, the language that Jesus was using? Let me show you something. Back in verse 20, referring to this young boy in the pigsty, it says, so he got up and went to his father, and that's just kind of a, something we might brush by, but if you look at the original Greek that this was written in, that phrase, he got up, is a, a Greek word, anistomy. And that Greek word occurs fairly often in the New Testament, and many, many times it is translated as resurrection, often in, uh, in, in reference to Jesus Christ and his resurrection. So, while that phrase literally means to get up, it's, Jesus is telling us this, this young boy is going from spiritual death to spiritual life. And that's why taking action is so necessary when someone is living without God. People need to do something about it because God views separation from him as spiritual death. And yet it's from that desperate situation that God desires every sinner to repent and turn to him because forgiveness and restoration awaits. Bible teacher Warren Wiersbe, some of you may be familiar with him, he notes the interesting parallels between the way the prodigal son came back to his father and the way that we come to our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. And he uses this verse, very familiar verse, John 14, 6, you all know it. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one what comes to the Father except through me. See, we come to our Heavenly Father through Jesus. So Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. So think of it for a minute. The prodigal son, who really represents us sinners in this parable, he came to his father, but there's a parallel in that we come to our father through Jesus. The prodigal, in verse 24, says he was lost. And Jesus says, I am the way. The prodigal, in verse 17, was ignorant. Before he came to his senses, he was ignorant of his sin and what to do about it. Jesus says, I am the truth. And in verse 24 also says he was dead. Well, what does Jesus say? I am the life. So we can see that our path to the Father is through Jesus Christ. That is truly the way that we come home. Well, how do we relate all this more directly? As I said earlier, this is part five of our series on Aha. So how do we relate this a little more directly to the Aha series? Well, remember the prodigal son was feeding pigs. He was so hungry he wanted to even eat the pig food that was being offered to them. And then, at that point, he finally awakens to how low he had really sunk. He had to be brutally honest about his situation and realize that um, something was wrong, but unless he did something, nothing was going to change. 
See, up to that point, he's got two of the three ingredients of aha. He's awakened to his sin. He's been brutally honest about it. And that's great. But what next? What comes next? What, what, what's he going to do about it? That's going to determine the difference between just a, a sad story and a real aha story. If he truly wants to have aha, he has to do something. He has to act. Because unless you act, it's really just an emotional roller coaster. And this is probably the hardest of the three ingredients of aha to get. I mean, it's, one, it's, it's hard. Honestly, uh, you know, honestly, it's hard to be honest. Uh, it's hard to be honest with God about what you've done and about have you uh, have affected your relationships with others. That's difficult. But translating that into action is maybe one of the hardest things in the world for us to do. Well, the prodigal son in verse 15, 20 realizes that he can't stay where he is. So he got up. This prodigal son didn't just stand up and start walking. He got up out of something bigger than just a pig pen. He arose, he got up out of his sin and started seeking a new life. That getting up can change everything. Getting up can be the difference between divorce and mending a marriage. Getting up can be the difference between struggling with an ongoing addiction and real freedom. Getting up is the difference between giving in to peer pressure and staying away from that stuff you swore you'd never get into. Getting up is the difference between continuing to feel isolated and forgiving that grudge that you've held on to for so long. So the question is this, what does it take to get up out of sin? Because unless you act, you don't really have aha. It seems that getting up involves three things, and these three things are these, examining yourself to, to find sin, wanting to turn from that sin, and knowing who's waiting for you when you do. First, you have to examine your life. The Bible calls us to examine ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. He's writing that to the church, to people who are believers. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. In other words, he's asking people this question. In what ways are you living in a distant country? It's quite possible for all of us to be living in the comfort of our home, we get up and we go to work each day, and yet spiritually we are living in a distant country. We are far from God's house, far from God's will. Examine your life now so you don't have to sink to the point where this prodigal son got to. It requires real honesty about your situation, and that continuing it is just unacceptable. It takes an understanding of God's will for your life and His power to help you. But if you don't know or believe that God wants you to change, then why would you get up? The second thing is you have to want to change. You have to want to do something about it, and that might involve certain risks. The prodigal son wanted to change. He realized something was wrong, and so he decided to go home, but I doubt he knew exactly how long that journey home would take him. I doubt he knew what he was going to do for food and water and, and shelter along the way. It was risky, but he knew he had to get back to his father's house. He didn't know how that place might have changed in the meantime. He didn't know if his older brother would ever speak to him again. But he knew that his life there would be better than what he had. And so he got up. When you have an aha moment, rarely, if ever, will God show you exactly what's going to happen from there. But you have to be willing to take the risk to change. Might not be easy. Might be the hardest thing you've ever done. But when God gives you an aha moment, he wants you to come home. It might mean saying, I don't know if I'll fit right in at that Bible study, but I know I need to go. It might mean saying, I might lose all my friends if I quit partying, but I, I know I don't want to live like that anymore. It might mean saying, I don't know if they'll forgive me, but I, I know the Bible says to be honest. It might mean saying, I, forgiving my parents might be the hardest thing I've ever done, but I know I need to forgive others the way Jesus has forgiven me. When you can see past your own situation and know what God wants from you, it makes immediate action possible. It makes it possible to get up. Well, the third thing you have to know is who's waiting for you. This son would have actually known his father, certainly. But there's no way that he would have expected his father's reaction when he got home. Absolutely unpredictable. Where was the father's anger? Where was the son's punishment? Huh? That's exactly what he would have been expecting. But what does he find? Celebration. A celebration. Even before the son got all the way there, what does the text say? That the father went running out to meet him. You have to understand that uh, 
for the people listening to Jesus tell this parable, when, when Jesus says that the father ran out to meet this boy's son, that is something that would have been almost horrifying. Because in that culture, uh, older men did not run. And one of the reasons was in order to run the garments, you'd have to pull up you know, their garments uh, so that you didn't get tripped up by it, and then you know, go running. And that was considered to be just totally indignant in that culture. And I believe that's true even today. Uh, when was the last time you saw an elderly Jewish man running down the street? Yeah, you know, you just, you know, they don't do that. It's, it's just really in that culture, it's considered very indignant. But this father throws off those kinds of social customs and taboos, and he, he runs out and hugs and kisses his son. And nobody listening to Jesus would have predicted that kind of reaction that the father had. And that's probably exactly why Jesus told this story. Because now we can predict it. Now we know what's waiting for us when we repent. We know what to expect. Aha begins with us, but it always ends with God. It begins with us when we take our life, our money, and we go off to our distant country. God lets us go. He lets us make the decision to leave. He lets us make the decision to abandon our family or treat people unfairly or pursue our own selfish desires or to try and fill up the emptiness in our lives with drugs or porn or anger or work or hobbies or video games. It starts with us. But it ends with God. When we say, I've had enough, I want to change, I'm going to change, I'm going home. It ends with God running out to meet us. And that's what it takes to get up. So when you move beyond examining yourself and beyond wanting to change, and you actually go home, your Heavenly Father runs to meet you. And when you know who's waiting for you, it makes it possible to get up. This prodigal son chose to turn and confess his sins to his father. And we, too, need to confess our sins to our Lord. Confessing our sins is actually a form of spiritual intimacy with Jesus. Intimacy involves a meaningful friendship with Jesus where deep secrets and struggles and successes are shared in prayer. But sin often keeps us from prayer. Do you notice that that's true in your life? Sin keeps us oftentimes from prayer, especially <coughs> confessing sins. This past week, uh, Jeff Crum um, sent out an email to the guys in, the, uh, in his men's group uh, about, it was entitled, when, when Sin Keeps You From Prayer. I found it to be so powerful. I wish that there was a way everybody could read this. Uh, maybe we can put that on the email chain or something. I don't know, but, but I was struck by the power and the wisdom in this little email. And what I want to do is share just some excerpts because it applies so well to what we're talking about this morning. It was written by a pastor by the name of Eric Raymond. And he writes this, Sin at its core is pride. But prayer, at its core, is the expression of humility. The only way out of sin is to humble ourselves before God, embrace reality, and plead for mercy and grace. Do you remember that first hour that you became a believer? What was your first action? Was it not a prayer of faith and repentance? Did you not call out to God, confess His name, and repent of your sin? This is the path to citizenship in Christ's kingdom. Prayer is tied to our faith in Christ. Prayer is the expression of our faith. Instead of sin keeping us from Christ, it should drive us to Him. It's been rightly said that sin will keep you from prayer, and prayer will keep you from sin. But it's also true that prayer will lead you out of sin. Remember, you are never too sinful to pray when your prayer is one of repentance. It's just so true. And there's so much wisdom in that. Just like this prodigal son ran to his father with confession and repentance, so too we need to examine ourselves and run to our Heavenly Father in confession and repentance. And now we know what to expect. Complete forgiveness and restoration. And folks, that is the good news of the gospel. We are forgiven from our sins. They don't need to be a barrier anymore. They don't be, need to be a reason why we should stay away from God or stay away from His people. God will forgive us and completely restore us and then we look forward to the greatest gift of eternal life with Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that there is only one way to come to You, and that is through Your Son, Jesus Christ. And I thank You for that wonderful gift 
of his sacrifice. Lord, we learn much from this prodigal son. We learn much in terms of who you are and what you want from us and what you are willing to give us in return for our repentance, and that is total forgiveness and restoration. Lord, the gospel is only good news. I thank you for that. I thank you for your love, your extravagant love, and your lavish mercy that you bestow upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us.